to go to Canada. I'm talking about 2005. I'm not, I don't mean 2002. Hmm. Okay. In the years leading up to the, the NATO surges of troops uh, into the countryside of, of southern Afghanistan, um, there was growing um, discomfort amongst uh, security experts and NGOs and a wide array of, of voices uh, about what they saw as um, growing insecurity and uh, warlordism uh, in the provinces. And so uh, a lot of, of, of NGOs and, and others uh, were calling for um, a large, heavily armed uh, international presence uh, because they wanted to extend some of the uh, programs and some of the sort of uh, state building that had been going on in Kabul uh, out into the provinces where a majority of Afghans live. And um, there was an expectation at that time that uh, they could be peacekeepers, that the international forces would be welcomed uh, with open arms. Uh, you might remember um, a British uh, minister saying that he hoped the British troops could deploy to Helmand province without a shot fired. Um, that turned out not to be true. Um, the, the Canadians, when they arrived in the spring of 2006 with their battle group, uh, doubled the number of international forces in the entire southern region at that time. Uh, there were only uh, 2,500 Americans down there. The Canadians came and, and doubled that number. But it was actually the uh, sort of the first wave because uh, behind the Canadians came a whole lot of, of Brits and Dutch and Australians, thousands upon thousands, uh, until by uh, 2011 there were 70,000 uh, international forces in southern Afghanistan. Uh, and so uh, with each successive wave of, of international forces, including the Canadians, uh, there was uh, a wide array of ambitions, you know, building girls' schools, improving governance, uh, poppy eradication, all kinds of things that the international troops were trying to do. Uh, but it was all under the rubric of something called the International Security Assistance Force, ISAF. Uh, and so at, at, at the very heart, um, the intention was to improve security, to bring uh, peace and stability. And unfortunately, neither of those things happened. Right. In, in, in 2005, before the battle group arrived, um, did, they, did Canada realize, did the leaders realize that uh, Kandahar was going to be quite this dangerous? Do you think that they were naive? Canada was terribly naive. Uh, the, the, the Canadians had no idea uh, how dangerous it was going to be for them uh, in Kandahar. I remember in 2005 speaking with uh, Canadian commanders uh, at Camp Nathan Smith, uh, the uh, military camp in Kandahar City, uh, and they said uh, on the record you know, that their expectation was that the entire insurgency could be quelled within a couple of years. Um, and in fact, they didn't see uh, the Taliban as uh, you know, the core of their mission. They thought that they would be doing uh, more reconstruction work than fighting. What, what were the goal? This was the provincial reconstruction team. Uh, what were the goals of them specifically? What, what were they planning to do? Schools, medical, bridges, wells? What was it? Well, the Canadians got drawn in. Sorry, just a bit of noise from the Skype there. The Canadians got drawn into uh, a sweeping uh, agenda of uh, nation building in, in Kandahar. Uh, I still have with me uh, a document describing all of the wonderful things that um, Canada and its allies uh, hope to achieve in Kandahar city. And it is a, it's a beautiful vision. I mean, they intended to build factories and have electric trolleys uh, on the streets and have parks and internet kiosks and, and all kinds of other uh, things were, were, were part of this really um, optimistic plan for uh, how Canada and its allies intended to transform uh, southern Afghanistan. And none of that happened? Very, very few of those dreams were realized. Uh, the Canadians and the other NATO forces um, very quickly uh, ran into a uh, vicious and escalating insurgency that continues to escalate to this day. 
uh, and discovered that um, it is very, very hard to export your um, Western visions uh, of progress into um, one of the most uh, forbidding and backward parts of the world. But, you know, um, I think there's a real risk in, in retrospect in saying that we should have turned the steering wheel 10 degrees to the left or 10 degrees to the right. Um, you know, I've, I've seen this over and over again, um, the kind of retrospective hand-wringing, uh, but we should have done this, we should have done that. And frankly, it often amounts to, um, you know, settling bureaucratic squabbles years later. Um, I don't know whether um, any of those minor adjustments would have uh, made the mission a success. Uh, the, the simple reality is that uh, when you invade southern Afghanistan um, with a crushing um, international force, a lot of the local people are going to fight you. Um, that has been the historical reality. And um, I think it's really revealing, actually. The idea that uh, some people, our guys, would, would rat out uh, somebody that was a rival by accusing them of being Taliban and that people would accuse each other of being Taliban and thereby leverage Western power to eliminate their enemies. Is that exaggerated or can you comment on that? It's, it's funny, Anand Gopala just stepped out of the room actually. Um, uh, he's, he's staying with me here in Kabul. Um, uh, it's true, um, sorry I'll find a way, different way to say this. In the years after 2001, uh, in some ways, uh, the Taliban was an enemy we created, uh, as some academics have, have said. Uh, you know, the, the government ended up um, picking fights with um, rivals in the drug business, um, old uh, tribal enemies, old people um, who they had fought um, uh, during previous wars. And, um, the Canadian military um, ended up being instrumentalized in some ways uh, by these, um, you know, whoever had captured their attention uh, inside the Afghan government and used um, to go after uh, their enemies. And um, that created a really um, unhelpful dynamic because um, what you ended up with was a war that was uh, understood uh, locally, uh, not as a war of uh, the state versus those who want to tear down the state, um, but as a continuation of, of old feuds. The foreigners were trying to fight too many wars at the same time in southern Afghanistan. There was the counterinsurgency war, that was the, the war fought in the daytime by regular Canadian soldiers who were, you know, patrolling the fields and holding little meetings with uh, tribal leaders, trying to gain their support, trying to basically prop up the government. Uh, at the same time, there's a war being fought at night by uh, elite troops, some of them Canadian, uh, who would fly around in helicopters and conduct night raids on, on villages. Uh, and that was uh, not just to uh, grab or kill the leaders of the insurgency, um, but also to go after anyone they thought might be connected to international terrorism. And at the same time, frankly, there was a war on drugs, uh, a counter-narcotics war uh, being fought uh, at the same time, in the same place. Um, fourthly, there was a culture war. Uh, we were trying to change the culture of southern Afghanistan by building girls' schools and, you know, uh, changing the, uh, the structure of government, uh, trying to instill ideas about democracy. Uh, so there were all of these things happening at the same time uh, on the same battlefield and it became a very uh, confusing way to fight a war. Was it all a mistake and should we just walk away? There have been uh, profound, tragic, almost unforgivable mistakes committed by the internationals here in Afghanistan which have um, measurably resulted in the mess that we have today of um, a rising insurgency, um, a government teetering on the brink of bankruptcy, um, and a feeling of, of profound exhaustion, I think, amongst Afghans, um, and profound disillusionment, really, um, with all of us foreigners who came and, and tried to change things here. Um, at the same time, 
uh, there is a very big difference between um, how bad things could get if we abandon Afghanistan now and uh, how bad they might be uh, with some, um, some careful effort at this point. Um, the international troops are withdrawing. Um, historically, what that's meant is that um, aid assistance uh, dwindles as well. And uh, it's not so much the troop withdrawals, because the troop withdrawals will be a double-edged sword. I mean, uh, on the one hand, the insurgents may have uh, fewer reasons to fight uh, as the foreign troops withdraw. Um, and at the same time, you know, an abrupt withdrawal is also destabilizing. But it's, it's the money piece, really. Um, you know, if the, um, if the foreigners don't want to keep paying the $5.5 billion a year it takes to fund the Afghan security forces, then you are going to have a very serious problem. Uh, and so uh, what I have been advocating is, look, um, some really awful things have happened so far. And I can understand why there is profound exhaustion amongst policymakers in Western capitals. But uh, abandoning Afghanistan at this point and, and giving up completely um, is not really an option. I mean, we've made a mess here and we should clean it up.